Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Liz Sace today. Liz is the former CEO of Disability Rights UK and has recently written a very interesting report uh, focused around employment and disability. Uh, really very interesting because it's looking end to end, uh, not at, at, at pieces, and I'm sure we're going to dive into that shortly. And Liz, you've also got a, a background in, in mental health and disability policy, so um, you really have got a, a great wealth of knowledge to share with us. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Um, so, so what was it that, that brought you to, to, to write the report that you've just published? Well, I, I'd been working for a long time on disability rights, uh, and we'd done quite a lot on what kind of support do disabled people need to help them get into work or stay in work but much less on uh, policy-wise, on what are the levers with employers. So, um, I mean, there was, one, uh, there was one bit of comparison that, uh, that, that we did that some disabled people and activists uh, liked, which kind of said that disabled people in the UK get sanctioned, that is to say, get their benefits cut um, about 60 times more often than an employer ever faces any kind of comeback for not for example, you know, for discriminating uh, in the workplace or whatever. In other words, a lot of the pressure is on the individual disabled person, but also that's where the support tended to be directed. And what this report about was really saying, employers need support too, uh, and, some t and there are different levers that could incentivize different behaviors of employers potentially, like, you know, sort of better help for small employers. I can talk more about that, but, um, but it was really saying, Policymakers always focus on the individual, getting them ready for work. What about getting work ready for the individual? Uh, and it's kind of uh, playing around with that uh, a bit of a switch. It's a bit yeah. like social model of disability. You know, you, it, it's not just up to the individual to get ready for work. You want to change the world around the individual. Then, as disabled people, we can thrive. Um, absolutely, and, and I think that was really one of the reasons why I found it really interesting because I'm yeah. responsible in my day job for trying to change the organization I work for to be better prepared to employ and to continue to employ and support people with disabilities to be successful. But at, at, at the same time, we see models around the world, because now I'm, I'm, I'm in a global role, I see models around the world that are effectively bringing people into the workplace, but not thinking about anything once they're there. And, and so it's no wonder people then struggle or fail or, or, or don't really realize their potential. We do need to be thinking about this sort of systemically. And, and, and also I thought what was interesting in, in your report was looking at the sort of all of the contributory factors and the, the, the fact that we have, and it's not just in the UK that this happens, but we have these, these benefit systems and these, but, and then they're all siloed. And there is yes, no definitely. continuity, and, and and this is something that a, a long time ago I worked um, doing stuff for the disabled student allowance. Yes. And we used to support students, and there was good support, and the universities were quite well geared up to supporting disabled students and understood the need, but they were also incentivized because they um, were rewarded for people getting grades. So if they could support the disabled students to get good grades, they would see a financial return on it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I looked at in this report was small businesses uh, and and people who have a fluctuating health condition, perhaps a mental health condition. And um, for, from the point of view of a small employer, it is difficult to take somebody on who's had quite a record of needing time away from work because you are thinking, how am I going to cover that? You know, it's there's issues of cost, there's issues of how you're going to hand, manage it. And actually, um, so with other people that came up with proposals where, whereby government could help um, and by, for example, a bit like the Access to Work programme in the UK, which will pay for things like travel to work if somebody, or if there's an adjustment needed, maybe in a small employer, that costs more than you could expect a small employer to cover, um, government will step in and pay some of that. It's like a sharing of the, a sharing of the cost where there is a cost. Um, so I'm proposing that if someone has a fluctuating condition, maybe they regularly need a month in hospital or whatever, 
that government could uh, fund the temporary cover that that employer will need and support that employer to get that temporary cover working with the individual, thereby taking away the disincentive from taking on the, from employing the person. Because there's a lot of people living on out of work benefits, certainly in the UK, who have fluctuating health conditions. And it's difficult for, for particularly small employers to, to recruit them. Um, and I think there are solutions, but it's about, it's about rather than employers doing their thing, government doing their thing, individuals doing their thing, actually putting the whole thing together and say, how do we make this work in a more seamless kind of way? So I, I'm a big fan of um, systems thinking. Yeah. Uh, and this is this is a classic example of systems thinking. You know, you're thinking about all of the interconnectedness and, and how all of these things relate. Um, and that's what we haven't done. You know, access to work is a great uh, a great um, thing in itself, but it's quite complex, um, and um, it's quite hard to claim. Um, so, for example, if you're dyslexic, everything's on paper. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so that's um, that's problematic. But, but, um, but it does it does offer some support, and it's, um, but it's. It's that whole sort of joining it up together. And it, the, the thing about access to work, and I think this is something that people don't realize, is that for every pound we're spending, it's something like one pound 20 back to the to the treasury in terms of tax and, and revenue. So uh, the government is investing rather than spending by doing yes. this. And I think that that was the, the, the other thing that we see in your report was that this was actually, you need to invest. This isn't a case of us coming and and taking money away and out of the economy. If you're doing this, you're you're actually stimulating the economy. Yes, exactly. And and similarly, you know, making sure that people can get the skills that that are relevant for the 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 what the work that's actually going to be available in the future. So I think you know historically we've often seen like separate training programs for. Uh, disabled people. We, we use the term disabled people in the UK, by the way, people with disabilities, whatever. Um, we've often seen these separate training programs, but sometimes they get completely detached from the actual labour market. You know, so what we need is to, to say, you know, jobs are changing. We've got automation. We've got AI, artificial intelligence coming along the tracks quite fast. And what are, there are going to be some new jobs coming, highly skilled jobs. There's, there's, there's going to be real changes. So. How are disabled people getting the skills? What are we doing in our skills world? Not shoveling off people to help prepare them for jobs that existed 30 years ago, but really kind of integrating, you know, policy on skills, on employment, on higher education. And it's doable. And if you invested in that, you would have a more, you'd have higher productivity. You would have, um, you know, a more fruitful economy. You'd also have better health and well-being of disabled people because we know that you know there's nothing worse for your health than being out of work, living in poverty, with not much to do and not much purpose in life. And 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 actually, um, you know, we've seen some small studies that show that if you get this right, you reduce the number of times people go into hospital. You know, it's a you, you create win wins for the economy as a whole, for the country and the economy as a whole. It just takes uh, exactly as you say that joining up. And some countries have tried to do that, tried to have a, like a disability strategy across government. I think that's really what we need um, in different countries. And uh, in the UK, we are certainly only partly way, part of the way there. I, I, and I think that it's that, that large vision piece that's really important. Um, Deborah, did you have a comment? Um, I know that uh, Antonio wanted to go first, and Sorry. then I'll go after. Go Antonio. for it, Antonio. Well, just so I don't want, I don't want to step on him. So, no, this is common all over Europe and all over the world. That most countries, you know, SMEs, you know, have an important role in the economic development. But at the same time, some you know, when SME does HR, sometimes uh, those doing that are basically accountants, taking care of the accounts, do the payments. They don't really have a strong support in terms of uh, human resource professionals to take care of, of the employees because we are talking about three or four people. So in, in order to, to find ways where they can 
hire and include pe people with disabilities within their workforce, what suggestions do we have for them uh, to, to make sure that they can actually d do and more in terms of employing people with disabilities? Yes, very good question. One thing that some large companies are doing is supporting small businesses through their supply chain. So, for example, um, there are some companies in the UK which, who do really simple things, like if they've got training materials, policies, internal policies and procedures, uh, training programs that people can attend, they're opening them up to their supply chains. So those people in the small businesses don't have to reinvent the policy on flexible working or whatever. They can just take it and use it. And it's part of um, you know, companies that are really trying to drive change through the supply chain. So I think that's one way. I think that sort of support from large business to small. Um, I also think that, you know, again, I do think there's a role here for uh, government in terms of um, making sure that it's really simple, that you know, there, there's sources of information and advice. I know in the USA, for example, with the um, Job Accommodations Network, you've got, and in Australia with uh, Job Access, you've got um, pages and pages online of good practice material, and it is kind of concentrated together. Uh, you know, I'm sure we could look at you know, how you could um, further develop those types of resources um, internationally, but but also um, backed up by being able to pick up a phone or send an email, because one of the things I think that is uh, so important for the busy manager or the small business person is actually they don't want to wade through lots of weighty good practice documents and codes of practice and stuff. What they want is they, they've got an employee who's just told them they've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or something like that. They want to know, what do I do now? about this particular situation. So people need that kind of tailored um, advice. And there are organizations around who can offer it, but it's pretty fragmented and quite difficult to find. So I think um, partnerships between government and business can make that much, much, much easier. And there's loads of good practice material around. You know, we just put it all together and make it, make it available. And um, just add in that piece of some one-to-one -one advice when people need it to be tailored. I, I think that would uh, go a very, very long way. Uh, I, I have been working on these issues a long time in the States. And when I was on the board of directors at USBLN, which is now Disability Colon IN, um, I, I have been a small business and entrepreneur since 2001, but before that I was in the banking industry and executive level for years. So I worked in large corporate America. When I moved over to become an entrepreneur, being somebody that's very committed to hiring people with disabilities, and most of my employees over 80% were technologists with disabilities, but often in these conversations with the gigantic um, national and multinational corporations, small business was never considered. So I was always the voice in there saying, okay, but we really have to think about small business. We look at some of our states like Hawaii, for example, in Hawaii, most of the businesses in Hawaii are small businesses. We do have some large businesses, hotel, restaurants, transportation in Hawaii, but that's just an example of one of our states. And so we have been trying to deal with this in the United States for a long time. And some of the things that we did that I thought were smart was we got our Chamber of Commerce involved. We got our Small Business Association involved. We also got our Department of Labor and Labor involved. And there I was also saying, what about small business? What about small business? Because the reality is for entrepreneurs, you are one person or two people, maybe three people, and you're working around the clock, ridiculous hours. You don't have a lot of money. And so to ask us to stop and include somebody with a disability that we do not understand the dynamics or the nuances of it is, is something that is just not going to happen. And we have not seen it happen in the U.S. or around the world. So I think there's so many opportunities. And of course, Ask Jan's a wonderful thing, but that's only one little piece of it, that it's a great place. And it's a place that's available to all of us, but at the same time, there in the, in order to deal with this at the small business level, we really do need to think differently. So I appreciate the report that you did, but I also found that um, 
we, we also have like the National Council of Small Businesses and things like that. So the more our government gets together along with some of the UN agencies and these small business organizations to come together to create some better solutions and make it easier, um, I think that's where we're going to start seeing at least a little teeny bit of progress, but there's still a lot of work to do. But I know I've been talking about this and trying to help in the U.S. for a long time with this, but there's 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 a lot of obstacles, and now we're in a gig economy, so now it's even more prevalent. Yes, yes, yes exactly. And and I think that, um, I mean, certainly here, and I, I, I think in the U.S. as well, uh, the sort of practical help from the state or from government hasn't been so forthcoming because people have wanted the market to fix it. And the market can fix a lot of things. But what the market, you can't really expect just the market in the case of small businesses to uh, to take responsibility for trying to increase the employment of particularly people with more complex impairments and need a lot of uh, adjustment or people who are going to have to have time out of work. Uh, and um, so, which is why I was kind of working on a shared, a, a, a different balance of responsibilities, like of citizenship. So rather than saying the individual is responsible and the employer is responsible, say it's the individual, the employer and government. And if you get all of that together and, and you have some both support from government and also some other levers. And so, for example, in relation to large business, um, I was proposing transparency, um, and I don't know what you think about this, but in this country, our large employers have to report publicly on their gender pay gaps. And um, as they do so, the shareholders take an interest. Um, uh, so some young people uh, are motivated in where they choose to work by the, the, the kind of reputation and the values of the company that they're, the companies they're looking at. So if they're good on the environment, if they're good on the gender pay gap, they might be more inclined to work for Burnham. So, um, so this is not about quotas or fixed numbers. I think it's about being open with your shareholders, with the public, with your peers, which might drive a bit of competition. Um, and our government at the moment has said they've encouraged large employers voluntarily to share information um, and reports. And, and obviously there are complexities, you know, um, how do you ask the questions? Do people want to be open? Um, what are the boundaries of what you consider to be disability? Is everybody on the same page? And so on and so on. But I think that with good business leadership, those complexities can be worked through. And um, I think there's an increasing appetite here in the UK, including from quite a few businesses, uh, to go down that line and use transparency as a lever. Um, and and some, some big businesses here are even saying, I don't understand why I have to report on gender, but not on disability or, or not on ethnicity. Um, so the idea perhaps of having like a, just one really simple dashboard about your workforce, only for large employers, you know, you don't want to put too much of a burden on small employers, but, just to show the world, this is what we're like as an employer. This is what this is what we're doing, and they, they could add in other things about their approach if they want to, and what, how how well we're doing. We think that could drive some some real improvement. It's here. It seems to be driving improvement on gender. And, yes, um, worth and, a try on disability. Yeah, it, that unfortunately is it's just not going to happen in the U.S. because of our litigation, and yes. we do have some. Um, transparency, they, we would not use that word, unfortunately, but um, yep. we do have our um, part of our Rehabilitation Act in Section 503, 501, 504. Um, uh, we have a goal of if you're doing business with a, the federal government, which is yes. the largest procurer in the world um, of goods, that's, you have a goal of 7%, and you actually have to report that, and that has to go to our Congress and Senate, and it, that has really, really um, cost a lot of efforts in the United States because our big corporations are really scared when things go out publicly for the same reasons that you just said. You know, the younger people are saying, I'm not going to work for you if you're a bad company and blah, blah, blah. I also want to comment on the certification. I know that when I was on the board of directors at the USBLN, now Disability Colon IN, I was one of the leaders that was working on certifying businesses 
for people with disabilities. And at the time, I, um, the 80% of my team were people with disabilities. And so somebody very nicely in the working group said, Deborah, we should have an exception. So if you have a small business like yours, where you, the lead, doesn't have a, doesn't have a disability at the time under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you still would get the certification because the majority of your employees are people with disabilities. And I said, oh, that's a great idea. I guess that's sort of like a white man owning a business where the majority of the workers are African-American women and you're right so I said no 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 we're not going to start bending the rules this is for this is certifying yes. business owners that have disabilities under yes. our Americans with Disabilities Act and then of course as you mentioned then we created this wonderful supply chain where our largest corporations the multinationals started actively supporting these vendors and it, it, we've had some successes there's a lot more to do but I, I, I think even in the United States, we're, we're so appropriately freaked out about litigation because it costs companies so much money and the lawyers get very, very wealthy and laws change and society slowly changes with it. I still think in the end, we're going to have to be more transparent. And some of the things that we see happening, like with the Valuable 500 that the Access Chat is yes. part of and Rue Global Impact is part of, these will all help. And in the United States, many people were saying, oh, the U.S. companies won't join, but they did because because of our litigation, a lot of our corporations have actually made a lot of efforts. We still got so long to go, but, and I also just want to say this one more thing and then I'll stop, but I also find in the United States, we've definitely made advancements with accessibility and with disability inclusion at people with disabilities, but I still believe it's the low hanging fruit. We are, we're hiring people with ADHD, with dyslexia, with, you know, somebody, we're hiring the things that these people are already in the workforce. They probably were not being appropriately accommodated um, or they, they were not being appreciated with how their brain brings so much value to the workforce. You look at someone like Neil that has brought so much value to Atos and he has dyslexia. So I would argue um, that he has had more value because his brain yeah. works that way. So we're doing that, but we are actually um, not only in the United States, but speaking from the United States, we're leaving out people with very severe disabilities out of these conversations, out of the workforce. And that is something that I'm committed with many others to change. So let me give you the mic yeah. and, I, and Antonio and Neil, I'm done. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, um, we have a successful program here, which I think began in the United States for people with more serious mental health conditions called Individual Placement with Support. And what that does is it supports the individual, but it also supports the employer. So the employer knows if I hit some obstacles here, I've got, I can just pick up the phone. Um, uh, I can talk to the, 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 the person from the, the employment support agency and, and, it, and it has proven its worth. But this was a, a group of people who, for whom the employment rate is just, you know, vanishingly small. So that sort of thing can be scaled up. Uh, it really could be. And I, yes, I, I agree with you. I think um, we have here something called disability confident, which um, so you can sign up as an, a business. I'm sure you know about it. And I suppose what I and others probably in the disability movement would like to see would be, rather than that being mainly about the, the policies and the procedures and everything that you've got in place, that it need, it's back to transparency really, that you need to be, if you're going to say that you are re doing really well in disability confident, um, we'd like to see, at least for the top level of it, um, demonstrating that you really are employing disabled people at different levels in your, you know, not just in the most junior roles, that you're employing different groups of disabled people, that then you would deserve to really be called disability confident and a leader who could share your experience, your journey with others. How did you do it? Um, so yes, uh, absolutely. I, I uh, agree with you. So, so taking on the point about disability confidence and, and you know, we, we know about it very well and, and and the organization signed up to that um, I think you're right in that this is a this is a, a process exercise rather than a people exercise um, and maybe it should be called disability competent rather than confidence because I think that you can you know achieve all of these things and people are still not confident really 
you know, the organization has processes and procedures in place, but they're not really confident and they're not comfortable with disability. Um, and, and I think that some of that does come down to the leadership because even though most organizations actually have people with disabilities in their leadership because most leaders are older and have acquired disabilities. The survey that EY did for Valuable was really enlightening in that out of the, um, the 40 odd CEOs, I think it was, that uh, responded that said that they had a disability, only six of them said that they felt comfortable enough to actually tell their colleagues about it. Yes. So yes. if our exactly. leaders aren't actually, you know, stepping forward and coming out and talking about their own disability, they can't expect the rest of the organization to be candid about it. At the same time, I recognize that there is this whole leadership culture thing where you're expected to be pretty much invincible and, and, and actually that needs to change. So it's not just that leaders need to, you know, talk about it, but, but the attitude that you have to be infallible, invincible, you know, leading from the top, working eight days a week, you know, 25 hours a day, you know, uh, holding up the world, the weight of your world on your shoulders. We're human beings and human beings have frailties and illnesses and disabilities. And I think people would appreciate that honesty but it's very hard once you're in that position and you've got that far by hiding it to then come out. I, I think that's exactly right. And I think, um, I mean, I've known a couple of leaders, both women as it happens, and, I, and I've, um, who have been very open in, um, not necessarily about disability, but about things like, um, I'm having a really tough time at the moment because my mother's very ill and, you know, sorry if I'm a bit off, off the pace or yeah. um, I'm having an off day. And just being very open, modelling that that's OK, you know, that you can do that. And modelling being kind of open about that we're, we're human, we have lots of, you know, facets to ourselves, including emotional ones. Um, and uh, what I saw with in, in both those cases was the the um, the people around them responded to that, felt they could do the same, and it increased the sense of motivation actually, because you know because people feel well, this is a place that values you as a person, not just in terms of can you put in the you know the requisite number of hours and you know increase your targets all the time and all of that and 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 that's another thing um, about you know we talk a lot about flexible working and agile working and so on. But actually, if you look at data, it seems to suggest that work has become more intense and that people have got, certainly in the UK, less autonomy in their working lives. And not everybody, but you know, overall, over the last sort of 15 years that, um, than they used to have. Now, if you've got quite a lot of autonomy, to some extent, you can make adjustments for yourself. Um, but also it's very motivating, it's empowering. You can, and it's good for the business usually because you can, you can come up with different ways of doing things. If you are absolutely, you know, you have to do this and you have to do it at great pace and you have to do it for 12 hours. And I mean, it's, it's quite, um, it's, it, it's not inclusive of a, of a lot of people in a lot of life circumstances, including, of course, people who might have energy limiting, conditions or people people with different experiences of disability, but also people who might be worried about who's picking up the kids if they've suddenly got to stay up, stay at work longer. So something about humanizing the workforce. Um, we've got to, we have to do that, I think. And, and you know, the, the hypothesis is that the workforce will then actually be more productive, not less. Yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's really um, great because I think you, you're, you're, right i think when flexible working works it's it is good and you do have autonomy yes. but we have the chimera of flexible working we don't actually have in in reality if, if flexible working just means that you're doing 12 hours of online meetings at home answering yes. 500 emails a day that's not flexible working flexible working is being able to pick the kids up is being able to um you know, 
decide that you want to go for a walk in the middle of the day because that's what's going to help freshen up your ideas mm. um those those kind of things or 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 you know being able to to have that autonomy to make decisions for yourself to to um you know dare i say it, budget some of the stuff for yourself and 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 take some risks i think that that as a society we've become very risk averse yes. and that has reduced the autonomy that people have and that can as you say then have that kind of knock on effect so although we have the the sort of remote working it's not necessarily flexible yes exactly and and when I was at Disability Rights UK, we did a piece of research asking disabled people who were in more senior jobs what had enabled them to succeed and thrive. And autonomy was one of the issues that came up. And some people were saying, I mean, as you said, some people were not open about their in, their experience mm -hmm. of disability, uh, but they were finding ways of managing it. Um, and some people said it's easier now I'm more senior because if I decide to go out for an hour nobody's going to question me um where but but then the trick about that is to say well if senior people some senior people are doing that um how do they make that more possible for other people in for, for their colleagues uh to reap those those benefits as well and also I think um I mean there's some very interesting work going on here about um people who work part time and how to progress in your career if you work part time it's, and, it, and it's very much started with the experience of parents, typically women. Um, but actually, it's very relevant for quite a lot of disabled people as well. But, you know, you get your career development can grind to a halt because you're not doing the 12 hours and you're not, you know, maybe you work with a personal assistant who has to support you to take you home at a certain time, or you can't necessarily just carry on working for another four hours that night or whatever. Um, this is something about um, enabling the whole everybody um, who's working together to understand the value of those flexibilities and understanding that some people may have different arrangements, all that. I mean, we've been talking about this for years, haven't we? But I just I think it's culturally hugely important. I, I agree. Antonio, did you want to raise a point? Yes, I do. Uh, so, Liz, I, I'm sure that you know, you know that you, you have the opportunity to uh, see uh, a lot of events happening in UK where we all talk about work, uh, future of work, technology. You have attended probably a good number of events where people talk about disabilities. But how can we bring these two worlds together? And we, we talk this not only between ourselves, but you know within in, but within the overall events where we discuss we discuss this in, in society. Hugely important question. I, I um here we've got quite a lot of programs going on, on on the future of work, what will work be like, um how we how what would there be some way of better regulating the gig economy, some of our politicians are interested in that um, and somehow that's a completely separate conversation from the conversation about disability and they they should not be separate so for one thing I mean the way I, I, and I know some of you are real experts in technology and I'm, I'm not so much an expert in technology itself but just to see how technology can kind of augment and enable people with a whole range of different experience of disability to do so many things, um, you know, it's transformative. But if that um, aspect of what technology can do isn't built in at the beginning into things like artificial or augmented intelligence, robotics and so on, we might, we're going to miss the chance to, you know, it, that could make, that could mean uh, that Disabled people can do types of jobs that 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 haven't been much open to, to, you know, even just things like autonomous cars. You know, if you've like those of us who have had mental health difficulties, if you've been um, detained in a, or had an experience of psychosis in within so many such time period, you're not allowed to drive. For example, if you're if you have a severe visual impairment, you can't 
drive. If you've got epilepsy, you may not be able to drive and so on. So lots of jobs that have driving as part of them. Well, with autonomous cars, um, you know, that could change, couldn't it? People could be able to do a whole range of other th other types of roles. Uh, and just kind of, um, and I mean, there's lots of probably, you know, just the, the, the cognitive um, work that AI can do as well, that, you know, that may be able to, um, well, it, you know, there's a, there's a link, it seems to me, between all those developments and what we've called adjustments or accommodations at work. You know, so they may kind of merge together and become enablers of people to do all sorts of different types of work. And that seems to me to be something we really need to reap the rewards of. Um, here we are trying, we have a think tank, for example, called the, the RSA, Royal Society for Arts and Com Manufacturing Commerce. And they, they're doing a lot of work on the future of work. We've just recently held an event there on disability and the future of work. So we're trying to kind of make those connections. Um, but um, but I still think that the, the discussions are too much in a silo, really, in silos still. We need to bring them together. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. And, and, and as a member of the RSA, Oh yes. That that message is not always getting out there even to the <laughs> fellows. So I wasn't even aware. Oh great. Okay, I'll, this, I'll, so. I'll, uh, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean it's good to hear that it, it's it's going yeah. on and um you know I know that the RSA is doing a lot of good work um the journal here. Um <laughs> so, um it's on my desk. So yeah, it's um it is one of those organizations that does do a lot of thinking but yes it is siloed i think that um you're right the, there's a lot of potential in in artificial intelligence and the way that we can use tech to augment and reduce some of the difficulties of just day-to-day -day living which yeah, exactly. are magnified by disability yes. and that, that that potential is really you know mm something to be hopeful about so long as we think about making it inclusive and we understand that potential because quite often we don't when we're building all of these things so it's it's that continuous dialogue between the the different bits of the business so i think it's 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 something that you know we're never going to be out of a job because technology is always going to be invented and we're always going to be needed to be going and you need to think about this yes um so so yeah we're never going to have it completely nailed well, um, what a conversation. It's been fascinating talking with you. We are at the end of our, our, our time, but I need to thank Barclays, Microlink, and MyClearText who are continuously supporting us to keep the lights on, keep captioned, keep accessible. Um, so, and thank you, Liz, for a, an amazing conversation today and look forward to the chat on Twitter, which I think is going to be really vibrant. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Very good to talk to, to everybody. Great. Thank you.